Hello and welcome to today's episode of Butterfly Kisses, A Journey of Spiritual Transformation. I am your host, Amy Gray Cunningham, and today I have an amazing guest. I am super excited about having him on today. His name is Bob Ginsberg, and he is the author of the book, Medium Explosion. He has been uh, seen on Netflix docuseries, Surviving Death. He has also uh, started a foundation with his wife, Fran, called the Forever Family Foundation. He began getting interested in life after death and what it means to exist after consciousness or still exist in some form after your body or your soul leaves your body. And when his daughter passed away in 2002, we're going to go into a little bit about his story and what got him started in this. And he's also uh, has a magazine called Signs of Life magazine. And he has started uh, a a medium evaluation certification program. So we're going to ask him a little bit about that and what uh, he does to certify mediums and where we go with that as well. So I'd like you to please welcome Bob to our podcast today. Bob, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Well, yeah, thank you. And uh, it's a pleasure being here with you. I, you know, if you roll back the clock 20 years, I would think the conversation we're about to have uh, would be pretty silly because I didn't believe in any of this stuff, you know, Um, I would have, you know, to me, uh, we were our brains, Uh, our brains uh, uh, produced consciousness. And when our brain died, you know, after physical death, what could possibly survive? Um, so I was a, a like many people, a logical left brain thinker. And after my daughter passed, I started to explore whether or not there were any credible people, you know, medical doctors, scientists, researchers, educators that had any true evidence that we survived a physical death, as opposed to, I know a lot of people, they say that they believe in an afterlife, but they kind of hope that there's an afterlife based upon their upbringing or religious beliefs and so forth. So blind faith is okay for some people that have a deep spiritual knowledge of the way things work. I wasn't blessed with having those beliefs. So I needed science, you know, to, to let me know. And I started discovering uh, evidence that I thought was overwhelming. And I was amazed that the general public didn't know about that. And when I talk about evidence, uh, I talk about starting with evidence that we're more than our physical bodies, that our brains are different than our consciousness. And when I say consciousness, you could say soul or mind, um, and that our our minds connect independently of the physical brain. And we know that through telepathy, mind-to-mind communication, you know, intuition, remote viewing. And then I started learning about near-death experiences and deathbed visions and reincarnation and after-death communications and mediumship. And, you know, I kept trying to dismiss each one of these things as coincidence or wishful thinking. But eventually, when you step back and you examine all of the evidence, you know, as a whole, the fact that we survive our physical death seems logical. It's the, it's the best explanation. How did you go about, I mean, your, your, your daughter had, you had the devastating loss of your daughter. Did you ever think about death or what happened to us, our, our souls, our spirits after we left our physical body before the death of your daughter? Was that ever anything that you even contemplated? Yeah, I didn't pay much attention to it, but I know that like many people, I lived a good part of my life uh, fearful of death. I mean, the the thought of being extinguished forever was uh, not something that I adjusted to well. You know, I mean, that's uh, when you think about it, a lot of people, I think, are have the same feelings. I mean, how could we just disappear and nobody will remember us and and, and we're gone? You know, it didn't make any any sense to me, really. I mean, if this life was part of some sort of grand design, you know, why be extinguished? You know, it made more sense to me that there was a continuum. But as I mentioned, I, I didn't really see how that was possible. I think like many people, you know, I was somewhat hopeful, but um I I really didn't I tried to dismiss it, put it on the back burner. And I think doing that is is problematic for a lot of people today, because if you live your life in fear of death, 
you won't be able to live it with any meaning or purpose because everything that you do, I mean, people, uh, you know, between, you know, medication and surgery, plastic surgery, and we all want to be young forever. Um, and we don't, if we can just embrace it, especially if you believe that there's a continuum and there's more to it, you can live a better life here in the physical. How has seeking answers to your questions about life after death, how has that affected your your life now? Well, you know, uh, after my, my, my daughter died, I, um, I was in pretty bad shape. You know, I just, you know, I could, I could not handle it. I was, you know, I didn't see how I was going to go on. I just wanted to curl up in a, in a ball and make the world go away. And I'm, I was done, you know, I just couldn't handle anything. So I, at that point, um, I had, I didn't see a way out of it. Fortunately, uh, my wife was very intuitive um, and she um, had these experiences and she kept having them, you know, after my, my daughter passed and I just kept explaining them away, but I was an open-minded skeptic. I mean, uh, which is different than being closed-minded and not accepting anything, but I just follow the evidence. And I knew that you know, we were together for decades and, and at, the, at the time, and she never, ever lied to me. So I know she wasn't making it up. So I was sort of living, she was my lifeline to, to belief and hope, you know, that maybe this is a possibility. I think that, and, and you know, eventually, you know, we started the foundation back in 2003, and we try to educate the people about evidence that we survive. And what we found is that People who believe um, that their deceased loved ones still exist in some form do better in their grief than those who don't. And it makes logical sense. I mean, what could give you any more hope than, you know, or comfort than knowing that they still exist? Personally, for me, I, I went for, I'd say, six or seven years, even though we started the foundation, and even though I, we were growing and I was giving talks and I was learning and I was meeting with scientists. I still can't say that I totally bought in. You know, I was at the beginning, I didn't help start the foundation to help other people. And of course that's changed now, but at the time I was just looking to work my way back into the world, you know, and try to figure things out for myself. Eventually, as I, I'm at the stage now where I think you, you go from hope to believing and ultimately, if you're lucky, you get to a knowing stage. And I think I, it took me many years, but I finally reached that knowing stage that there is more. And you can reach that knowing stage in various ways. You could have a profound personal experience, like a near-death experience or an after-death communication, and that flips you in your way of thinking. Or you could learn about things. And, you know, there's a, such a thing as called the bibliotherapy. You can read, people feel better when they read books about these things. And, and so, you know, you can, you can uh, change the way you think uh, just by learning. Uh, so uh, it's important, I think, for people... Um, to remain open-minded. I mean, we don't try to convince anybody. We just try to tell people what's established out there and let them, you know, form their own opinion. Now, your wife has since crossed uh, in, it looks like September of 2020. Have you received any signs from her from the other side or? Well, you know, it's in, it, what's interesting about that is that many people contact me now and they say, boy, you know, you must have a an easier time dealing with, you know, the death of Fran, because this is what you do. And this is what you talk about. And, and, you know, and, 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 you know, I know that you, I got a tremendous number of signs after my daughter passed, but it doesn't quite work that way. I mean, we're, we're human, uh, you know, grief is grief. I mean, I think the advantage of believing in an afterlife is that when we reach those really low points, you know, they, these deep chasms of despair, we could dig ourselves out, so to speak, by reflecting upon what we really know to be true. So, you know, whereas people who have no hope and, and no uh, reason to believe that death is not final, they have nothing to, to, to help them dig out from, from their sorrow. As far as signs, uh, I, I, you know, as I, I mentioned, after my daughter passed, I received, you know, just to sign after sign after sign, and they were incredible. I mean, uh, things that happened. Since Fran passed, I haven't had a lot of direct, you know, signs or communication. However, uh, there's such a thing as electronic voice phenomena. And what that is, 
um, you know, people set their intention to speak with a deceased loved one and they turn on a recording device, which could be uh, your cell phone now. You know, back in the day, they were real to real recorders when it was done. Now it's everybody's cell phone, you know, you can record on. And you just turn on the, the recorder after setting your attention for 20 seconds, 30 seconds, you shut it off and then you play it back. For most people, nothing happens. And some people experiment with this for a year before they start to get voices. And other people, for unknown reasons, get voices right away. So we have a, a medium that's been certified by a foundation. Uh, her name is Janet Mayer, and she was uh, very close with my wife. And she's, she's asked, after a uh, friend passed, she asked if it would be okay, because um, she was experimenting with electronic voice phenomena just as a hobby. And she said, I'm going to make up seven questions every week, and I'm going to pose them to Fran in spirit and turn on the recorder. And then she would send me the audio files. So in one recording, uh, she said, Fran, what's the name of the organization that you founded? And you hear on the, on the tape, Forever Family Foundation. Uh, and another recording, it happened to be my birthday. And, and Janet said, do you have any message for Bob? And then you hear faintly but clearly, happy birthday. You know, so um, to me, things like that are, I do consider those to be powerful, you know, signs or evidence because we have, it's something we can perceive with our physical sense, uh, senses. I have the recording, you know, the, uh, I have the evidence. It's not something I could argue that I, that I made up. So uh, in that sense, uh, I've had some communications, but I haven't had any, you know, powerful direct communication. And I, I don't, even though we've been certifying the best mediums in the world for since 2005, I never ever got a reading from one of our mediums and simply because they know too much about me. So I could never trust the information, you know, so I don't go to, to, to mediums, even though it's part of our life. But I, I would say that knowing my wife and, you know, being married for 46 years, she knew everything about me. And, and, and I know that she's probably coming up with something that even I could not possibly question. So something big is gonna happen. It just happened, hasn't been able to been, be communicated yet. That's very interesting. My, uh, my husband recently passed in um, June of 2021. And I have a, several recordings from him as well. I oh, really? Up, yeah, yeah I, I set up a recorder. And one time I, I, you can hear him saying my name. You hear him saying Amy. And it was shortly after he passed, which was kind of cool because they, I've been told that that's really hard for people in spirit to do. But on Christmas Eve, I set up the recording and I told him for Christmas, the only gift I wanted to hear was him, excuse me, telling me that he left me and I got it. How, how wonderful is that? <laughs> <laughs> he left me a message and it says, I love you. And you can yeah. hear it on the recording just as plain as day. Yeah, um, that's great. Yeah. yeah, so that was my Christmas gift. What have you found through your research? Because I guess you've, you've done a lot of research based off of your website, a scientific research to prove life after death. Well, there's a lot of established evidence. I mean, I think that near-death experiences are very evidential because you have people that meet every definition that medical science has for death. I mean, they have no brain waves, they have no heartbeat, they have no respiration, they, they have uh, no reflexes. I mean, they're dead as far as medical science tells us. And yet, despite having no brain waves and being dead, they have these clear and lucid experiences. Not, not, not every near-death experiencer has the same uh, experiences, but there are certain commonalities that they have. Some describe, you know, moving through a tunnel and seeing a, a bright light that they move towards. Most describe uh, having the vantage point of leaving their body and being able to see everything that goes on from a, from a different vantage point. Uh, some people see deceased loved ones and are greeted by them and have conversations. Many people return with heightened and you know abilities, intuitive abilities, and knowledge that they didn't have before. So, it, I think it's very evidential because the least thing, the last thing you would expect from somebody whose brain is not working is to have a clear and lucid experience, and yet they do. Um, and 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 many cases, there have been cases with people who are blind; they've been sightless since they were born. 
uh, they have an, an NDE and they see themselves in an operating arena and they come back and they're able to describe everything that went on, the movement of, of people, the colors, you know, the equipment that was being used. Uh, and these are people that never had, you know, sight and yet they're seeing colors and everything in perfect uh, clarity. So uh, it goes to show that our, our mind or our soul uh, consciousness can leave, you know, our, our physical body. And that's what happens, you know, when we physically die. It just so happens that due to resuscitative techniques, these people are able to, to, uh, to be brought back. And many of them, um, they're angry, you know, they're, they're pissed off, you know, I mean, because they, they came from this beautiful place back to a body where they're ailing or, or in a lot of pain and so forth. So uh, many describe being told that it's not their time and they have to return, you know, and despite arguing to the contrary, you know, they return. So, I mean, that's one form of evidence. Um, people have um, these end of life experiences or deathbed visions where in that window of time, either just before physical death or in a two week period before that, they um, describe and they reach out to deceased loved ones who, who are there uh, seemingly to help them cross over. And, and very often, well, most, almost all the time, loved ones sitting in the same room can't see what they're seeing, although sometimes they can. Um, and the implication of, of that is, is, is tremendous because in a spiritual sense, it means that everybody, whether they're able to communicate it or not because of their physical or mental condition, has help when they cross over. Um, and that, that's a pretty, you know, comforting thought. Thought I, I, I experienced it with my own, you know, family members. Uh, I remember when my mother was was getting ready to, to cross over, and she was sitting in a, in a reclining chair in the living room, and the family we were all sitting around her in a semicircle of chairs, but the chair directly in front of her was empty. So at one point, my mother, as sick as she was, she reached out to that chair where her arms were extended and she started talking to her mom. You know, the other people in the room didn't know what was going on, but, you know, Fran and I, of course, knew what was happening and we were just, you know, listening. And at the same time, my father walked out from the bedroom and he saw the empty chair in the living room. So he went and he sat down and my mother started freaking out, you know, because he didn't know he sat on his mother-in-law, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, so he was like, what, what, what? And she's like, get up, get up, you know? So, uh, you know, we've seen these things um, that happened, uh, you know, with my wife recently and talk to anybody that works in hospice, um, you know, and they will tell you countless stories of people having encounters with, with their deceased loved ones. So, you know, that's another form of evidence. Uh, reincarnation has been, uh, researched for, you know, 50 years, you know, thousands of cases of children who have past life uh, memories. Uh, a couple of cases were featured in that Net Netflix surviving death series uh, by Jim Tucker, who was a medical doctor, and he took, took over the work of Ian Stevenson, who he amassed uh, these thousands of cases that he investigated uh, over four decades. So, I think that that is uh, another, um, the evidence is overwhelming. And I think that's another uh, discipline of research that's, that's very valuable. And perhaps most important, people have after death communications. You know, scientists tend to dismiss it because they're anecdotal. They're not studied in a laboratory, but yet, you know, for, for since the dawn of man, people have been having these experiences and, and, um, and um, they can't be dismissed because it's just, you know, it's, it's just so many people that continue to have them. And it could be in the form of um, dream visitations, um, you know, where the person in spirit sees an opening where your, your chatter mind is set aside when you're in that REM stage of, uh, of, of sleep and they see what, you know, a, a clear channel to get through. And, and they're very different from regular dreams because they're not disjointed and, they, you know, they, but they're, um, they're very tactile. You could see your loved one, you could talk to them and you could smell them, you could hug them, you know, and so forth. Um, and, and you remember them when you wake up, whereas most dreams, you know, you, you, you can't recall them at all. Um, and then, you know, uh, people's, you know, movement of objects, synchronicities, uh, all sorts of uh, various signs, uh, you know, that happen and people love to 
talk about them when they're in the proper setting. You know, that's the problem with a lot of these things is that people are very afraid to open up because they're afraid of being labeled or judged or, you know, put in a box, you know, or this is your grief or this is all fringe stuff or your imagination. And that's a shame. And, you know, some of the things that we try to do at at Forever Family Foundation is encourage people to share their experiences, you know, just, you know, to friends or colleagues. and, um, and, And when we start talking about things that we experience that will go a long way in changing worldview about how we think of ourselves and how we think about that, because it'll come out of the closet, so to speak, of something to be, you know, whispered about as something that can be embraced and talked about. Has there been any research done? I know for myself, I've thought about this quite often since Chuck has crossed, but, you know, where exactly is heaven and why can't we actually see our loved ones. Yeah, you know, it's an it's interesting question because what do we do when we think when we want to talk to our loved ones? We you know we look up, you know, like that we always look up because it's, you know, that's our vision of of, of heaven. You know, I mean the, the thinking is that it's just another dimension. You know, we have different planes of existence. So Chuck could be right in two inches in front of you, you know, just another veil with with another plane of existence you know exists so in a spiritual sense i mean the literature seems to suggest that there are many different planes of existence so some call it spheres some call you know planes or levels and so forth but the theory is also that when we cross over we tend to be among people that are were of like mind and that we progress from there Um, you know, or maybe we start off at a different level. And perhaps it has something to do with the way in which we live our lives here. I mean, somebody that was a a mean SOB and and, and did a lot of bad things, maybe it start off at at one level, or somebody who was somewhat enlightened and compassionate and loving may start off, you know, at a different level. But I think it's, it's clear that everybody progresses, you know, and becomes uh, uh, more enlightened um, as they go through this continuum of life. Why do you think some people hear from their, their loved ones who have crossed and some people don't? I don't have any real answer for that. You know, that in, in, in studying, you know, all of these cases over in history, there have been times, they call them crisis apparitions where people see somebody that they didn't know had died, you know, and then, and they have a visitation and they have a conversation with them. And only later do they learn that that person had died a couple of minutes before um, they saw them. So that's a communication people are able to do almost instantly. And we know a lot of people, um, this you know, I know from experience is true is that people receive more communications shortly after their loved ones pass than after, you know, many years have gone by. Some people get signs constantly in communications and others don't get them at all or get them real rarely. I don't know the reason for it. There's a, there are certain people that are better communicators from the other side than others. Um, I think it's a learning curve. I mean, especially if you didn't think that there was life after death and now you die and you wake up and you're still alive, you must be a little bit bewildered, you know, and you got to adjust and you got to learn. And perhaps there's mediums in the um, afterlife the same way there are mediums here. They help these people to, you know, to get through, um, you know, and some people, maybe, maybe some people are, are, are just busy doing other things. Maybe people are still learning. Maybe they're waiting for another time. A lot of people go to a medium and they don't you know, make any connection. Maybe the person in spirit doesn't want to communicate through that medium. Maybe they want to try to get through to you directly. I mean, with mediumship, there's, it's a very delicate process. You have the, the medium and then you have the person in spirit and then you have the sitter you, who get, who's getting the reading. And if there's not a, a resonance among all three parties, um, it's not going to happen. You know, it's kind of a miracle when it, when it does happen. But yet we find, um, and that's why we started the, the certification program back in 2005, is we try to identify people that truly can do what they claim. Because I, I, in my book, 
I didn't make a lot of friends when I said that I thought based upon my research and my own um, experience that 85 to 90 percent percent of the practicing mediums today can't do what they claim. Uh, you know, only 10 to 15 percent can. And that's been borne out in our own program. Where it, after all these years, only 10 to 15 percent have, have, have gained certification. And there was a difference between psychic information and mediumistic information. So in other words, um, there are some people that are very good at reading your mind or, or perceiving a future event, but they have no ability to communicate with somebody that's deceased. It seems to be, even though it's part of the same process, it seems to be two different skill sets involved. Um, I know a lot of everybody says that all mediums are psychic. And in the sense that they're, um, I mean, I view mediumship as, as mind-to-mind communication. It's just that one of the parties no longer has a body, but it's, they still have a mind. So in that sense, it's still a psychic endeavor. But, uh, you know, not everybody, uh, some people that call themselves mediums are actually very, very good psychics, but very poor at communicating with somebody that, that's in the spirit world. Can you tell us a little bit about your certification program and what that looks like? Yeah, I mean, I, I back in 2005, I met with um, a few scientists uh, that study mediumship in various you know, universities, and I kind of picked their brains to develop our own program. And it's a rigorous program. We we um, we evaluate the evidence that a medium provides in a reading. Um, we train sitters, people that get the readings, on how to score information. You know, specific information is scored a lot more heavily than general information. So if you're the medium, Amy, and you're giving me a reading and you're seeing me and you say, Bob, uh, you have a great grandmother in spirit. I'm like, yeah, you know, she'd be like 140 now. But, you know, so (laughs) but, you know, the sitter would have to mark it. I'd have to mark it as a sitter is true because she gave me a statement that's true. Uh, But then again, if you said, Bob, I have your great grandmother, Rebecca, here and my great grandmother's name was Rebecca then I would have to give that more, score that with more weight than the previous general statement, because now you gave me something that's specific. So we're looking for, you know, specific information and it's a long process and there are interviews and there's extensive applications. And then there's, there are these, uh, they do a, a series of five different readings for five different trained sitters. And if they meet all the minimum guidelines, then they gain certification. Um, you know, the problem from our perspective is that a lot of the mediums that we've certified over the years have gone on to be quite famous, you know, they TV shows and writing books. And so, you know, what happens when somebody becomes famous, they do fewer and fewer readings, they charge a lot more money, and then they have a really extensive waiting list, which kind of defeats the, the, the purpose of the program itself, which was to be a resource for the bereaved. So if you if you desperately want a reading and you call up and you say, oh yeah, I could see you in three years and it's five hundred hours, that doesn't do any good for me. So you know, so uh, you know, we're an all volunteer organization at the foundation. I mean, nobody gets paid, so there's you know, time is is precious. So now I'm in the in the process of really gearing up uh, the medium certification program. So because we need to identify you know, more people that can do this, uh, mediums that don't have extensive waiting lists and don't charge a lot of money. So um, we're we're gearing towards that again. How do you find the mediums? Do they find you or do you find them? They find us, you know, we we never um, go after or request any mediums because we don't want to dilute the integrity of the program. So if I'm soliciting you to join, then it, you know, it's not a good thing. So yeah, we, we have it on the website that we have a, an email that they write to um, after they, they email us and we'll send them a series of questions. And then there's an application and then there's an interview. And then eventually, um, if they make it to that point, uh, they go through, through the process. And, you know, it's very difficult uh, mediums, and I understand this, to be put in that position because mediums have never been evaluated under controlled conditions in their lives. And it's, and some of them, like, they, they know they're good mediums, but they get all flustered by the, the setting and the you know, kind of the clinical atmosphere. And, you know, there are some good mediums that just don't do well, and, you know, and, and they don't gain certification, but we always allow them to come back 
at a future point, if they, you know, figuring that either they've improved their skills or now they're more familiar with what's going to take place. Is there a cost for the certification? Just no. in case there's any mediums out there that are interested. No, everything um, is, is free. We don't, we, don't, uh, we don't charge anything. They can't pay us to be listed on our website. I mean, you know, no money exchanges hands in the process. So is that why you started the Forever Family Foundation was to certify mediums or how did no. you get involved in certifying me mediums? What, what was the purpose? Well, I, uh, that? I, you know, uh, that was mediumship was just one of the things that we're interested in. But at the beginning, before we started the foundation, my wife and I saw a lot of crappy mediums <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and people started reporting a similar experiences. You know, people think a medium is a medium and they're all the same. They're not. You know, because we started the foundation, we started dealing with people in grief. This was a necessity, we thought, you know, and that's why we started the program, you know, to provide reliable people that people could, you know, uh, could visit, you know, and, and to try to make contact with, with their loved ones. You made me think that it wasn't a while back, I did a survey, you know, I, I get, we get to do these surveys because we have almost 12,000 members and you get a good you know, base to, to draw from. So, and one of the questions that I asked on the survey is that if you had a choice, would you rather receive communication from your deceased loved one through a medium or directly to you? And when I composed that question, I was sure that the vast majority of people would say, I'd rather have my loved one come to me directly. Uh, but then when the results came in, the majority said that I'd rather get communication through a medium. Uh, so then I had to try to figure out why. So I started doing, you know, follow-ups and I found there were two reasons. One, people said they'd rather get through a medium because there's a certain amount of fear that comes with the process. Uh, people have a fear of the unknown and they thought there was something that they'd rather somebody else do. But more importantly, a lot of people said that if my loved one comes to me directly, I'm going to question it as maybe it's my imagination and I'm really just making this up. Whereas if it comes through a third party, an expert, you know, then, then I can believe it. So then I understood the reasons and they're logical reasons, you know. Personally, for me, I'd rather have my loved one come to me directly. Uh, I'd rather have that, that personal, you know, proof than coming through a third party, but there's no right answer to that. Yeah, sometimes I, I can understand how our own minds get in the way and we, we rationalize, try to rationalize what had just happened. Yeah. And, yeah. and to, to make more sense out of it. But then there's certain things that happen, like the voice recordings that you're like, there's absolutely no other explanation for why I have this recording on this. Yeah. And so what's interesting, Amy, is that so you have this recording and then um, if you even if you play it for friends or whatever, they may just dismiss it because they'll come up with, you know, any any type of an answer. But when you receive these communications, not only electronic voice phenomena, but in any really compelling communication, it's the knowing that's attached to it. I mean, when you heard that that voice, there was absolutely no doubt you know, the, in, in your mind that this, this was real and nobody was ever going to tell you anything different. And, mm -hmm. and that happens often. And that people say, well, how can I know if this is really real or not? If it's attached to that inner feeling that you can't describe that knowing in your heart, then it's, then it's real. And that's the only best way to describe it, you know? Yeah. He's Chuck's constantly opening doors. He leaves doors open for me. And, or closing doors, he's closed the bathroom door. I mean, things will happen throughout the night. I'm the only one here. And I wake up the next morning and certain things have happened. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Sounds like he's a gentleman, even from the spirit world. He's yeah. opening doors for you, he's closing the bathroom. But yeah. <laughs> yes, so yeah, he, it's, it's very interesting. How can, for someone who is looking to go to a medium, how can you tell if a medium is evidential, if they're giving you the correct answers? What is... The yeah. Pro, what is a good protocol for for working with the medium? Well, I just I I wrote a book about that. You know, um, you know. That, the, 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 the that was going to go into my next question. <laughs> but uh, but um, it's it's a good question because it's often asked, and and the point is there there are no 
you know, mediums are sitting with bereaved people and there are no organizations or, um, that uh, really test their value, you know, evaluate their proficiency or their ethics or their, you know, or do any investigation and, you know, about their background or background checks. And yet they're sitting with people that are in fragile states. I mean, it's, it's really frightening. They're really in the mental health field when you think about it, because they're dealing with grieving people. And yet I can tomorrow just um, start Bob the medium and hang a sign up and start charging people money. Uh, so it's a real problem. And there is an explosion right now of mediums because they want to be like so-and-so on TV or that there was somebody they saw in a movie and they thought this is a, an exciting thing and I can make a lot of money. Uh, but it really comes with a, a, some deep responsibility. People should think long and hard be, you know, before they decide to become a medium because we all have intuitive ability to some degree. You know, Some are much more profound than others. But it doesn't mean, even if you have strong intuitive ability, that you were meant to do this for a living, you know? So how do you identify? Well, certain organizations like, a, like, like for the Family Foundation, we have a, a list of mediums that have gone through this rigorous uh, evaluation process. So, you, you know, there are links to those. There are other organizations, uh, science-based organizations like the Winbridge Institute that have also... Uh, isolated mediums that that have been you know uh, tested under controlled conditions you know there's also um, recommendations uh, although it's no guarantee I mean if if you go to a medium and you have a great reading I might go to the same medium and not and they won't make any connection so it's no guarantee but at least it, it it's some it's better than nothing and you know it's some you know guideline that you can use um, you should go to their websites before you decide. I mean, personally, this is my own preference. I would much prefer that somebody do one, one thing really well than 20 things, you know, marginal. So you go on somebody's website and they're a medium and, you know, and they're a psychic and they're, they clean out spirits from your house and they're a life coach and they, you know, and they do 20 different things. I would rather see that they just concentrated on their craft, you know, which is the mediumship, you know, so may maybe that's a factor. You could see if they, um, if you, now we could do research on, on, on anybody. So even on medium, so you, you know, you can sort of do your own, your own background checks. And while we're on that subject, now we know mediums are all doing readings via Zoom, right? Just like we're doing this interview right now. The, and the COVID changed that because they're not doing, you know, personal readings, but that opened up the possibility of fraud exponentially because we, we uh, caught a medium once that they were doing, um, was reading on Zoom. And on one side of, this, uh, of, the, of the medium's computer screen, uh, they had, she had Zoom open and she had the person's full name, you know, because the person registered, you know, for Zoom. And on the other side of her screen, she had uh, the person's Facebook page open and was reading back every single identifying fact that the medium found on Facebook to the sitter. You know, and the sitter is like, wow, this is an amazing, this is a great medium. But the medium was totally fraudulent and they were just spitting back the information that from, you know, that appeared on social media. So it is a problem. Um, so I would also tell people, give the medium as little um, information um, as possible. I don't really have a problem with somebody even giving a different name, <laughs> uh, you know, because it's, it's uh, um, that, that's a possibility too. And then uh, you should, you know, we, um, especially if you lost somebody, I mean, you, as a sitter, you desperately want the medium to make a connection. And you, sometimes you hear things that really aren't said, you latch onto something and you make it fit, you know, because you desperately want that connection. Um, so you have to be open to everything, but be discerning. And I recommend you always should record uh, a session. If the medium tells you that it's not allowed, I'd be suspicious. You know, maybe they just don't want an, uh, uh, evidence of a, of, a, of a poor reading out there. Uh, if you can't record it, absolutely take notes because you can refer back to the recording of notes later to determine exactly what was said and, uh, and what was not. And, even, and the other benefit is that if you have a wonderful reading, evidential reading from a medium, 
and you start getting in one of those um, periods of deep sadness, you can listen to that recording again. Wait a second, they couldn't possibly have known. My loved one you know, has to exist. So I think there's some grief benefits to, to having a recording. Yes, I've actually seen a couple mediums since Chuck has passed and it's been very interesting the, the things that they have come back with and the things that they've said and evidence that he's even been a part of what's going on in my life now, because there's no way they could have known certain things that I'm doing now. And they were able to say, yeah, he totally is. He, he loves the way you've decorated the house. And I mean, specific items in certain places and yeah, uh, you know, that they've never been in my house and I definitely didn't have it on Facebook. So no, and then, and then you have to say to yourself, okay, was was the person, was the medium receiving this psychically, uh, or you know, were they really communicating, you know, with Chuck? But if they're, if the medium is giving you information about Chuck, you know, evidence, um, mm -hmm. and then says to you, hey, Chuck is saying that he likes what you just did with with the house, that's evidential because they've yes. already established that they're talking to Chuck. Yes. You know, um, you know, a lot of people ask that question: Do our loved ones know? or keep in touch with what's going on in our lives. And uh, I can tell you that about six months ago, I was in my kitchen washing the dishes. And sometimes I talk, I don't know if you do, but I talk out loud to, to, mm -hmm. to, to, to Fran. And I said to her, I, you know, sometimes silly stuff. But I said, Fran, I don't care what you say. This sink was poorly designed because every time I wash the dishes, the water goes splashing out all over everything and the counters. Like so, so. The next day, I got the next morning, uh, I got an email from that medium that I told you about the other day, Janet Mayer, and she was doing a personal meditation that she does every morning. And she sends me an email and said, Bob, I was doing my morning meditation and Fran came to me and she said, you got to get in touch with Bob and mention the kitchen sink. <laughs> so, so I said, you know, I, I had just been talking to her about the kitchen sink, you know, so you know, those are kind of extraordinary things, you know, because, uh, you know, it just happened. It's like in real time. I guess they, I, I don't think they're with us 24 hours a day. And when we go to the bathroom and watching everything, yeah. that we do. but in, when we, when we reach out to them, either vocally or through our mind, I think they, they pay attention. I had an incident where it was right before Christmas and I was getting, I was at the moment where I was getting stressed because I was trying to finish up Christmas shopping, trying to, you know, get the house ready for everybody coming over. I'd been at the mall all day and I came home and the dogs had to be fed and the house still was a mess. And, you know, there was just all this going on. And I started talking to Chuck out loud and I'm like, you know, and, and it was when he was alive, he was the one that always grounded me because he knew I loved entertaining and he knew I loved having the family over. And so he was the one that, you know, he would make sure the dogs were fed or they were let out or, you know, he would vacuum without me asking. And he was always the one that, that helped, helped me. So I remember raising my voice. I was like, the least you could do is vacuum the flipping floor for me, you know, <laughs> figure out a way to vacuum. You can't get out of doing your chores. Five minutes later, I'm not kidding you. I got a text message from my old housekeeper who had moved to Chicago saying she was moving back to Charlotte and wanted to know if I, I needed her services again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you ask so, and you receive, right? <laughs> so it's yeah. not him actually vacuuming the floors, but now my housekeeper's back. So. <laughs> Problem I'm solved. Like, I'm <laughs> like, okay, Chuck. And all I could do is laugh. I'm like, all yeah. right. Yeah. I, I I asked and here it is, you know. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, thank absolutely. you, thank you. Well, is there anything else that you would like our, our listeners to know about either your book or your foundation or any of the evidence that you have research you have come across? Well, I, I would encourage people to go on the website. It's for foreverfamilyfoundation.org. Uh, there's a lot of information on there. Um, there are links. We have a, uh, we've been airing a, a weekly radio show since 2005. So the chances are, if you read a book about somebody that's involved in this realm of, of, of the afterlife, we've probably interviewed them and we archive all the shows. So you could just listen to the interview. Um, and we have, um, 
grief retreats um, throughout. Uh, we have them in, uh, on the West Coast in California, Florida, Connecticut. And uh, the one in Connecticut was one that was featured in the, that Surviving Death Netflix series. Uh, so all our events are posted there. We have webinars and, and uh, uh, various different events. Uh, the book is called the, the Medium Explosion. That can be picked up on Amazon. It's sort of a guidebook to the world of mediumship and how they can do what they do and how to manage a reading and evaluate it, you know, uh, independently. And uh, other than that, um, I write a, a personal blog on beyondthefivesenses.com. So I get to... Uh, get stuff out of my head and put it down on paper there. So some people maybe will find that interesting. I love that. I love it. It's actually a really good blog. I've read some of your, your yes. blogs. So. Thank you. Thank you for doing that for us. Well, one question I ask all of my guests before we, we end the show is if you had an opportunity to speak with somebody, whether that person be in this physical world or in the afterlife, who would it be and what would you talk about? Well, to, you know, I mean, to me, it's just, it, it, it's an obvious uh, question. I mean, I, I would, out of everybody, I'd rather talk to uh, my daughter or my, or my wife, you know, because uh, they're the ones that mean the most to me in life. And we always have the feeling that of things that were left unsaid, and we all wish that we would have said some things that, that we did and that we didn't, we didn't say some of the things that we did. So having an in-depth uh, it all comes down to love. You know, you just, I think we're fearful that we never really express the, the you know, the true depth of our, of our, our love to them. So having, um, hey, I used to say after my daughter passed that I would trade my life and everything that I own, you know, for five more minutes with my daughter, you know, and I still feel that way today because yes, I know that she still exists, but we're human and not having them in the physical, you know, is, is always going to be, you know, problematic. So uh, for me, I'm, I don't care about people in history, or I don't care about celebrities, or, you know, I just want to talk to um, both of them again. Yeah, I would give five minutes to talk with Chuck again. So. Yeah, I know how you feel. Well, that's the other thing, you know, people look like us that you know, I'm sure a lot of your friends and, and, and family and colleagues, you know, don't really understand what you're going through, but I do because I'm like you, you know, so mm -hmm. there is, there is some value to being among people. And we, that's why we have these retreats that truly know what you're feeling. And you can talk about these things and not be labeled as being crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sometimes I wonder if my friends think I'm a little crazy, but they still love me anyway, so. Yeah, well, the heck with them, you know? I mean, yeah. it's, it's about you at this point, not them. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bob, thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate all of your, your experience and your research and your thoughts on this. It's been a delight to have you on today. Thank you. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Butterfly Kisses, A Journey of Spiritual Transformation. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe by hitting the subscribe button. This way you won't miss it when a new episode is released. Also, if you're interested in learning more about Akashic Record readings, you can schedule a free 15 minute consultation with me by visiting my website at amygraycunningham.com. Again, thank you. And remember, always spread your gorgeous wings, my friend, and fly. Until next time, see ya.